Netflix launched its streaming service in 2007. Since then, we have expanded to more than 190 countries with 282 million paid members. It's truly a pleasure to see our content are being joined by so many people. To create streaming content, you need a video pipeline. You may not know, 2007 was also the year our video pipeline went live. Started as something very basic and simple, over the years, our pipeline has gone through tremendous transformations. We moved from linear processing to chunk processing to reduce the latency and improve resiliency. Added fucking encoding to deliver superior visual quality to our members. We tapped into the internal smart market to harvest the unused power of idle EC2 instances and integrated with the studio's metadata system to enable innovative storytelling like the show Black Mirror and Snatch. Our investments in encoding innovation and the picture quality metric also earned us two Emmy Awards. All in all, the experience of the past 17 years has taught us a flexible, easy to innovate pipeline is critical to our continued success. Hello everyone, I'm Li Wei, a software engineer at Netflix. Today, I'm going to share our recent work of building the next generation pipeline for Netflix. Here's the agenda. I will start by briefly talking about some contexts, and for the majority of the talk, we will discuss how we build this next generation pipeline. And at the end, I will be very happy to show some results. So where is this pipeline? The pipeline sits in so-called production to play paths. It takes the metadata file from the studio and transcodes it into multiple formats. This encoded video file will be further packaged, encrypted, and pushed to CDN server for our member to enjoy. Our previous generation pipeline, codenamed Reloaded, was launched in 2014. At that time, we were a very small team, and the number of use cases was very limited. Over the years, our team has more than tripled in the size. In terms of our use case, both the breadth and the depth have exploded. With such a huge growth, limitations of reloaded became obvious. So what are the limitations? First, in reloaded, there is no clear separation between infrastructure bits and the application bits. As a developer, while developing the new features, I also need to take care of the platform bits, for example, file I.O. to the cloud, retry kind of stuff, which I'm not really good at, and certainly will slow me down. Second, due to historical reasons, we have some functionalities bundled together. Just to be clear, we are not cool about that, and that's really not something we are proud of, but it's what it is. For example, the WMAP calculation, the video quality score calculation, was implemented as part of the encoding process, which means unless you reduce the encoding, there's no way you reduce the WMAP calculation. Last but not least, Reloaded is a single big repo, and we didn't intentionally enforce any boundary. As a result, we often saw that code reuse across the boundaries of the components and for no good reasons. Such kind of accidental dependencies making independent deployment very difficult. So due to all those couplings, we took the approach of deploy everything, deploy the entire reloaded all the components all together. As you can imagine, that means a huge test of service. To minimize the risk, every two weeks, we took a snapshot of reloading all the components and we promoted it to be release candidate. Then, in the next two weeks, we tested it again, 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 try to catch every possible bug. So, depending on when your code was merged, it could take anywhere from two weeks to four weeks to go into production. It's just too slow. So reloaded, 
the pipeline that used to serve us well now becomes the drag. Clearly, we have outgrown reloaded. We decided to build a next generation pipeline to get our velocity back, to get our flexibility back. The work started roughly around 2019, and early on in the journey, we made an architectural decision that we want to build this new pipeline using Cosmos-based microservices. Cosmos is Netflix's new media computing platform. It's designed in a way that it provides all the platform functionalities, but hides away all the distributed computing details. Yeah. So as a developer, I can focus on things I'm good at, like developing application. Microservice architecture are supposed to decouple, separate the functionalities into different services, and the service boundary, there are strong boundaries. So by doing so, we hope we can achieve independent evolution of individual services functionality. So that's the rationale behind this architectural decision. To build the new pipeline, the first step is to identify functionalities and map them to services. A general principle is that if it's a single functionality, it deserves its own service. This sounds very simple, but could be surprisingly tricky in practice. Here's one example. Video encoding is a single functionality, right? But how about AVC video encoding? VP9 video encoding? How about AV1 video encoding? They are even more single functionality, right? And your decision matters here. If your service is too big, you run the risk of introducing coupling, which is not good. But on the other hand, if your service is too small, it could be equally bad or even worse. You may end up with an army of small services which look very similar to each other. You may find yourself duplicating code here and there, making similar changes across all these services. We are software engineers. We enjoy doing creative work. And this kind of work are just the operate. They can easily wear you out. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. Here, we want to offer our approach, which is based on some hard learnings. First, everything is a trade-off. To reach a reasonable balance, you need to invest time to understand the differences, commonalities, and the relations among the functionalities you are dealing with. Second, creating a new service has overhead. When you are not sure, start with the course of functionalities, but keep the internal boundary clear. So in the future, if you need, you can split them out relatively easily. And rest assured, you will make a mistake for sure. That's the last point. Be open-minded and be ready to change the decisions you made earlier. But that's a good thing. That means you are learning, you are growing, you are gaining insights in the process. That's really something you should celebrate. Now back to the early question we asked. We decided that video encoding is the functionality of the right size, and we would like to create a service for this functionality. So how do you create a Cosmos microservice? Cosmos has this three-layer architecture. The top layer API is the gateway to the external world. Everything goes through this API layer to interact with our service. Media processing has normally multiple steps, so that's why the second layer is a workflow layer. This workflow layer doing orchestration for these media processing steps. And the bottom layer is the mass of the computing layer. It's a serverless function layer where you can summon as much computing power as you need. For scalability reasons, the three layers, they communicate through the message queue. To build our video encoding service, we need to codify the encoding contract in the API layer, implement a video encoding workflow in the second layer, and execute the actual video encoding in the third layer. The contract of video encoding is quite straightforward. 
to encode the video, you need the user to give you a source video. And also, you would like a recipe, which captures the user requirement. So source video and the recipe, these two make up the request body. And of course, you need to give back the user encoded video. And there can be surprise. In case of the failure, you also want to send back some error message so the user may be able to take some action. So that's the output. And that's it. That's our API, that's our contract, that's our VNS API layer. For the workflow, the platform allows us to describe the workflow as the DAG, directional cyclic graph. Nodes means actions, and edges means dependency. You can also use annotation to indicate possible map reduce relationship in your processing steps. This is the deck of video encoding workflow. The input will be first split and into chunks, and for each chunk, they will be encoded. And only after all the chunk encoding are ready, they will be fed to the next stage assembler, where they got stitched together based on the order. And the assembled video will be validated, and the color will be notified of the results. Now moving to the bottom layer, in the computing layer. So here, the platform automatically mounted the cloud media file, and the mounting was done in a streaming way to minimize the risk, the latency. Just like anywhere else in the, on the cloud, there will be some hiccup in the networking. So there will be timeout, retry will be needed, but all this will be handled by the platform. Your video encoding codes can be literally like this. It's just feel like you are actually encoding a local file. We want to get our job done, and we also want to get it done efficiently. Ask anyone who has experience with video encoding, they will tell you that HD encoding is more expensive than SD encoding, and AV1 encoding is labor intensive, and there's no one size fits all resource model. To maximize the resource usage, Platform allows us to specify how much resource we need for each job, how many CPUs, and how much RAM. So by getting this information from us, Platform will be able to do some magic, like beam packing, to minimize the waste of the resource. During the development process, we also need to think about how we are going to onboard the production traffic to this new pipeline. We support a long list of encoding formats, so it will take some time for the VES to be fully feature parity ready with the reloaded. We could either wait for all the features to be ready, then do a big bang switch, or we could switch shift the traffic as we go, which means whenever a relevant feature is ready in the new system, we will shift that particular traffic portion. We decided to take the second approach because we are believers of early feedback and the iterative improvement. Also because once the new feature is ready in VES, then we no need to keep investing in the reloaded, which will which can avoid some throwaway work. So how to achieve this? We first need to build a bridge layer and ask our user to call this bridge layer instead of calling reloaded. And we also place the VES behind this bridge layer. Now, for all the incoming requests, the bridge layer will check are they, do they qualify for VES. If they do, bridge layer will convert them into the format of the VES request sent to VES for processing, get the results back, convert to the original response format, and send back to our users. This entire process is totally transparent to the user. They wouldn't notice anything. Only after all the features are ready in VES, we will tear down this bridge layer and let the user directly talk to VES. OK, results. So step by step, service by service, eventually in 2023, we have the entire pipeline ready, and we switched over all our traffic. Here is a rundown of the service we built. We actually created more services than this, but some of them are just too netly specific, so I didn't bother putting them here. 
we talked about the video encoding service earlier. And for the input, we want good input because otherwise it would be just like garbage in, garbage out. So that's why we have this video inspecting service to inspect and flag bad source. Our encoding optimization is content-based. We have this complexity analysis service help us to understand, to analyze the complexity of the source to make recommendations about how to encode the source. We do adaptive streaming, which means we don't create a single stream. We create a ladder, multiple streams with different bitrate, different resolution. And this ladder generation service help us to figure out how to optimally design, configure this streaming ladder. And now WMF calculation has its own service, video quality service. Yay. We also want our output to be good. That's why we have this video validating service validates our encoded videos. The benefits are enormous. With the new pipeline, we have significantly enhanced our flexibility. Now, each service can independently evolve. As long as we keep the API strong and stable, there's a little chance they will interfere with each other. To the users, now we have multiple services, each providing a dedicated functionality. The user can do mix and match. They can customize the service orchestration, which can better meet their needs. Our productivity also got a huge boost. Due to the single functionality nature, in this new world, code changes tend to be small size and cohesive, making code review easier. Because of the strong API and the separation between application and platform, the test surface is also better defined, making them easier to manage. The new pipeline helps us achieve our goal of continuous delivery. Remember in Reloaded, we can only do this production push every other week. Now, we can do production push multiple times a day, and each time it only takes roughly 30 minutes from code merge to production. That's really remarkable. That's the last slide. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you learned something interesting from this talk. If you want to know more, we have two technical blogs published for this topic, and here are the QR code. Feel free to check them out for more details. Thank you.